So, you know, as I said before, you know, this presentation looks at the the other side of Jamaica. And, um, local Jamaicans will tell you that oftentimes they hear about two Jamaicas, right? So you go to Jamaica, you enjoy the pristine beach, the hotels, and, and its culture, its music, its reggae music, but Mali. But there's a, an, an underbelly to the Jamaican um, experience, and that is what I want to zoom in, in a little bit uh, today. So essentially, since its independence, Jamaica has not had any democratic decline. There's been no coups. There's been no reversal of its democracy. However, it has been plagued by um, violence related to gangs. Political violence is very, very, very an important part of understanding um, the Jamaican crisis. Now, since the 1990s, there has been an increase in criminal gang activity, especially in Kingston and its adjoining metro areas where on average 60% of all murders occur annually. And this is according to the uh, Jamaica Cyber Force, which is the, the uh, police uh, unit. Uh, the JCF estimates that there are approximately 200 established gangs uh, in Jamaica, comprising mainly of young men between the ages of 14 to about 30 years old. Um, the last UN report I looked at, looked at 2013, Jamaica is ranked number six in the world in terms of its homicide rate, mm -hmm. uh, headed by Honduras, Venezuela, El Salvador, Belize, Guatemala. Colombia has dropped to 10. So it, it is not just a Jamaican problem, it's an America's uh, problem. And hopefully I'll get to some of the reasons why we have that problem uh, in the America. So what sparked my interest uh, is 2010. We had a we had something happen in 2010. In May 2010, uh, the Jamaican state had an extradition warrant to execute uh, from the United States. They wanted this guy called Christopher de Descook for gun and drug trafficking charges. The Jamaican government dithered for almost a year before that in providing and giving over these guys to the United States. And it became a political stalemate. In the end, they decided to go into the community to get this guy extradite him. We had a problem with that, or there was a problem with that. And this placard stood out uh, to me. Um, people said that this is a guy we are unwilling to give up from our community. He's a benefactor to the community, takes care of the community. In the absence of a strong uh, Jamaican state, this guy provides employment, this guy provides job. Why do you want him? We don't want to give up. And it's because, you know, Jesus died for us, we will die for Julius. And essentially, what you had was a major protest. Uh, women came out in the droves, wearing white, with placards, said, you cannot take this guy. Um, Coke had gang members who were, who were loyal to him in Kingston, but also from other parts of Jamaica who were now coming in to fight against the Jamaican state. And like, wow, the state is under pressure against these criminal gangs. But within the community, he's seen as a local hero. So that was really my, the, the spark. And so my main argument then is that the roles that dons perform in Jamaica's garrison affords them positions of power, but also legitimacy among residents. So I'm viewing dons as embedded governing actors. Uh, they have legitimacy among residents. Uh, they provide them with access to certain kinds of resources. And so my real question then was, what's the reason behind this protest? Is it fear? Do they fear Christopher Koch and his gang? And so they are compelled to be out there to protest? Or is it legitimacy? They really see this guy as being legitimate? Or a combination of both? But let's zoom in and talk about who, well, the methodology before I get into who are dons. So essentially, uh, this was a qualitative um, research design. I did about 45 interviews. I did interview former gang members. In fact, there were some active dons who said, hey, we'll talk to you if you want. If, if you want. I declined the offer uh, to speak, to speak with, 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 active, with, act, with, act, with active dons, lest I be subpoenaed by the police to give information. But I spoke with former gang members. Why? Uh, issues of uh, security, uh, yeah, safety and security. I didn't want to. Um, you know, I was speaking with police and with uh, former gang members, and I was speaking with the police and speaking to Dons, may pose a risk of, of safety. So I decided to to not do to not do that. But if I wanted to, I could have. 
but I, I decided not to. Spoke with residents in, in these communities, spoke with elected officials, though they were very hard to, to get. Uh, elite interviews are so difficult. The elites, they tend to be very, um, you know, they carry their own corners. But I was managed to get a few, few of, of those. Uh, did some unobtrusive observation within uh, the communities that I, that I studied, just to observe what's happening on the street of course i got questions why are you here they knew they know when you are there doing when someone who's an outside is there they know and the questions were asked and i had to provide explanations i had a local gatekeeper who helped to provide access and say this guy is here doing some research he's fine <laughs> so that was the, the general um, method used in carrying out the research but who are dons and i'll be using this word um, <coughs> Alan, you might be wondering who are done. So let's let's talk about it for a few minutes. So the word done is of Spanish origin. It is from the Latin dominus, which means master or lord. The word became popular in the Jamaican context in the late 1970s into the 1980s to describe informal community leaders in its inner city cities in Kingston and other surrounding areas. Duns are leaders of criminal gangs, and they engage in several licit and illicit markets to acquire wealth and purchase weapons. They evolved, however, from being partisan enforcers and henchmen for two of Jamaica's main political parties, uh, the People's National Party, PNP, and the Jamaica Labour Party. So to understand who Dons are, we have to go back to as far as the 1940s. Uh, Jamaica was still a, a British uh, colony. Um, its main political parties were formed in the late 1930s. And as a means of, of maintaining power within communities, political parties used local strongmen to carry out acts of violence, to int intimidation and fear. And so dons emerge within that context. So it starts off with politics, which is quite un unlike most other places in the Americas, that they, there's a strong tie between criminal gangs, or there was a strong tie between criminal gangs, these dons, and um, politics. All right, so even, so they evolved over from being part of an enforcer and henchmen for Jamaica's two main political parties, PNP and the JLP. By the 1970s, the picture began to change as these enforcers gained more autonomy from their partisan bosses. Even more so in the 1980s became a watershed moment for these informal community leaders. They changed from being partisan puppets to hegemonic figures inside garrisons. They began to perform security and social welfare roles, thereby shadowing the Jamaican state. They acquired enormous wealth and weapons from their involvement in cocaine and gun trafficking from South America through the Caribbean corridor. So drugs became a game changer for Jamaican dons. Now the, 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 the tail began to wag the dog, right? So they were now kind of distancing themselves from their political um, masters, as it were, and became more autonomous in and of themselves. And that was part of um, the, the real um, problems with our Jamaican dons. So in a nutshell, dons are male. I found no female dons, though women play an, an important part in organized crime. And this is a gap in the literature, right? You often do not hear of the role that women play uh, in organized uh, crime. Um, in the Jamaican context, a number of women, they, they serve as couriers, drug couriers, they take up drugs. Um, some of them sit on community councils. These dons have councils that decide who is to be disciplined and who is to be punished. And women make these kinds of decisions, at least women who are close to to dance. So they are masculine, it's a masculine designation. Uh, they are awash with cash. Not all dons do are awash with cash. Some are, not all. Um, and they have the trappings of material wealth, car, the flashy cars. Uh, and a very important thing for the don is respect. The don must be respected. Uh, they crave respect. And if they are disrespected, then violence becomes an, an, a, a, a tool training and get back this res uh, respect. Uh, they use violence, they are violent. Uh, they have several women. Again, part of the masculine designation of a strong man is that his virility has several women. It's a kind of a, a, an urban subculture, uh, so to speak, in the Jamaican context. Um, and they have jurisdiction over avenues within a particular community, streets within a particular community. Some duns have jurisdiction over an entire community. And then there are other duns who have jurisdiction over several communities. Christopher Koch, 
uh, and I refer to him as a megadon, had jurisdiction over several communities. In fact, to date, I would say he's the last super don, the last megadon that Jamaica has seen. All right, let's push on. What are garrisons? Garrisons are urban inner city slum type communities in the Jamaican context. Um, they are often characterized by homogenous and in some cases patterns of overvoting for either of Jamaica's two main political parties. Overvoting, referring to fraudulent patterns of voting in which there is more than 100% voter turnout in any one area or constituency. Ballots are sometimes cast for dead persons. Yes, the dead, the dead, the dead, <laughs> they do vote. Um, I will say that this, uh, the, Electoral integrity has vastly improved since the 1990s in Jamaica, but you still have these problems, all right? Uh, especially in some garrison communities. They are characterized by governmental neglect, poor housing stock, uh, unsanitary environments, improper drainage systems, and garbage disposal. These neighborhoods are also divided by polarized partisan identities. So a lot of garrison communities are either PNP, People's National Party, uh, communities or JLP communities, very partisan uh, in, in nature. Um, they are also divided along different gangs. So these ghettos, in the classic sense of that term, often experience violence related to turf, rivalries, partisan warfare, and contests concerning the dominance or relative status of a don or multiple dons. Many residents in these communities live below the poverty line and experience economic and social squalor. These communities were created Yes, they were created, they were projects, housing projects in the 1960s. And depending on which political party you were aligned to, you would get access to those, house, to those housings. Mm -hmm. For example, in, in Tivoli Garden's case, where Coke is from, uh, that community was essentially created by one political party, Jamaica Labour Party, and persons who were, who were affiliates with the party would get access to those housings. So they were created uh, fundamentally. Um, so aside from these communities being manufactured, being partisan, being plagued by political violence, economic squalor, limited access to opportunities, garrisons are also social spaces where some of Jamaica's urban poor <coughs> reside. The black urban Jamaican poor, they reside in these garrison communities. Not all uh, black urban Jamaican poor live there, but a number of them live in garrison uh, communities. Uh, the downtown, as they refer to downtown residents, they are often used by politicians, used by their dons to uh, maintain their spheres of power. Um, these are also cultural spaces where Jamaica's dance, its music, its urban food culture. So you will hear about the pan chicken and the jerk chicken man mm -hmm. on the roadside, the Jamaican guys, and you can get those, those things. Uh, reggae and dancehall music culture of their birthplace from Jamaica's garrisons. Bob Marley uh, grew up in a place called Trenchtown, which is one of Jamaica's garrison communities. Um, tourists, oftentimes when they visit, will go to the garrison areas to enjoy the dancehall street culture. And the uptown, it's because the uptown elite Jamaica and their kids will come down to enjoy the dancehall space in the garrison, but then they leave, right? So these are not just spaces of violence and spaces of decadence, but they are cultural spaces as well. And this is a very important um, thing to understand about the garrison space. It, 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 it's a social, organic space where you have these multiple things happening uh, all at once. Yeah, in the, in the community that I studied, about 65% of the residents in the area were unemployed, had absolutely no form of job. Had, uh, no qualification, 74% had no qualification, no skills. So it was very difficult for these residents to be integrated into the Jamaican economy and society in any meaningful uh, kind, kinds of way. And these are some of the, the placards which were up with regard to what happened in May 2010. In fact, right now there's a three month, uh, three month uh, commission of inquiry uh, seeking to look at how the security forces conducted themselves in May 2010, which left 76 civilians dead and one military person uh, dead. And the investigations are probing whether the security forces used excessive force. And in fact, they did use excessive force in 
conducting uh, um, the extradition. This is what these, you know, when I was doing the research, you know, I, I wondered what are people fighting over? Why, 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 why do, what do Dons want in these communities of squalor? Well, they need garrisons as their uh, areas to have to conduct their drug running activities. Turf means power for gangs and dons, right? On the surface, when you look at like, what could these communities offer, but these turfs mean power for uh, gangs and for dons. All right, let's push on. Oops. Neoliberalism, that thing we love to hate, hate to, mm -hmm. hate to love. It certainly played into uh, this as well at the macro uh, level. It had the effect of plunging uh, Jamaica into greater debt, debt right, sorry, um, to the IMF in the 1980s particularly. And several social programs geared towards community development were scaled back or discontinued as a result of um, Jamaica's uh, taking on these IMF structural adjustment uh, reforms. Um, I can, let's, talk, let's look at this, it's debt, Jamaica's debt over time. Jamaica's a high debt society. It has the unenviable position of being the Greece in the Caribbean mm -hmm. space. It is true, unfortunately. Uh, the latest data, this gives you a comparative analysis, uh, 2012 data from the IMF. Jamaica, almost 150% of its GDP is consumed by its debt. And so what happened is that neoliberalism helped to hollow out, to weaken the state's capacity in carrying out infrastructural uh, redesign in these communities, in carrying out social programs, in carrying out sports programs. In, in, in other words, they were left up to themselves. And what this con context did was create a fertile ground for these, remember those henchmen I spoke about? These guys now, who were now tapping into the drug trade, they were getting the cash, they were the ones who, were, who became the new governors of these forgotten cities, as it were. All right. So drugs and guns. Three, where am I? Okay. Good. Let me get a hold of my papers. Okay, I didn't print that one, but it's fine. I can talk about it without, um, without the papers. So the, the drug trade really became a game changer for Jamaican dons. Uh, and if you understand the Caribbean space, let me pull this map up. It's a porous region, right? So you have Colombian cocaine coming through the region. Jamaica is a transshipment point, like other areas. Uh, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, uh, the Bahamas are important um, uh, transshipment points for cocaine coming into uh, the big US uh, market. And with the passing of cocaine, what happens is that the dons are used by the Colombians as the transporters of that. And they are paid with cash. They are paid with their own stash of cocaine. And what, what the Jamaicans uh, did, the dons, in, uh, in being ingenious, what they call stepping. They stepped on the cocaine. So they would mix the cocaine with baking powder and improve uh, their revenue. So they're getting paid by the Colombians. They are stepping on the cocaine. So they're doubling their, uh, the amount of cash that they can get. They're getting weapons. So all the time, communities in Jamaica, in Haiti, Dominican Republic are getting more and more uh, violent as these guys are armed to the teeth. And you have turf wars in communities. And Garrison had turf wars over uh, being these drug uh, entrepreneurs as it seeks to serve the US and the UK uh, market. So it essentially really became a game changer um, for it. And this picture gives us, so the Caribbean corridor, as you can see, it's very, very important in the 1980s, major supplier of drugs. And uh, the latest uh, reports that I've looked at 
the DEA in 20, 2014 report that it has increased from 5 to 16 percent. So the region is now re-emerging as an important player in drugs being transshipped um, to the United States. All right, let's push on and get some discussion. So let's go back to our dance for a moment. Who these guys are really? So I went into the research thinking that, you know, Don is a homogenous category, that Don's are Don's. Turns out that that is not the case. And so I developed this typology of, of different types of Don's. In the area that I studied, um, I found a plethora of street Don's. These Don's tend to be more violent because they have less to offer to their communities. So they use violence as a means of controlling streets within their uh, um, garrison areas. They tend to control only a street or one or two streets. Uh, the community had an area done, and I won't call um, names, had an area done, and um, he provided welfare, so he sent kids to school. He wanted to send to go to school, he will, provide, he will pay tuition costs at the high school level, send you to school. Uh, a number of these dons have legitimate businesses. Christopher Koch, and I can say it because it's, it's published, he had a construction company, incomparable com uh, enterprise that did housing, plumbing, and oftentimes he would employ youths from the area. So they see this guy as a godfather. Uh, one uh, Jamaican anthropologist, uh, Dr. Barry Chavans, now deceased, refers to dons as folk heroes among garrison residents, the provider. Um, and interviews, I interviewed a few uh, residents over in his community, and a number of the older people said, look, when we need medication, it is short man, they call him, he's short, short man or the prezi. Mm -hmm. He provides us with uh, money to provide medication. So don't tell us that this guy is a criminal. Who decides who becomes a criminal, right? He provides for us. Another important um, thing that many of these neglected communities, and this is true in favelas in Brazil, this is true in Bahia's, uh, in, uh, in Latin America, Central America, is order. You need that sense of order. And dons provide that. It is a perverse type of order. It is violent. But citizens, in a kind of a rational choice, they make a calculated decision to accept some of the violence for greater order. So for example, Dons will carry out um, control via jungle justice. What is jungle justice? Well, if you steal from your own community, you could get a, 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 a beating with, with a pickaxe stick. Uh, but you could have your, your arm broken for stealing from your own community. You could steal from somewhere else, but not your own uh, community. Rape, that's a serious offense under the Dons jurisdiction. You could lose your life for being charged for rape. Um, if you cause the police to come into the community, so if you commit a robbery and you bring the, and you bring the cops into the community, you get what they call a road sentence. And so you have, to st you have to leave the community. You can't come back until it has cooled off, then you, you may be able to come back, right? One of the things that Christopher Koch did and, you know, in his community, and it, this came out in some of the court testimonies, is that children who go to school, at eight, you have to be off the streets. This is a gang uh, leader who has youths working for him, but at the same time, he understands that youths, they should be home in bed by 8 p.m. If you're on the road, you could get a beating for being on the road. So you can understand that the, 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 the dualism, the dual... Uh, sense of identity that is coming out among Don. So from the outside, uh, outside Jamaicans, I was guilty of that as well, would see Don's as just perverse, violent actors, which they are. But they also provide these kinds of roles and duties within garrison context. And so that is why we have people come up with this placard, Jesus died for us, we will die for Dudus. Not all Don's are like Dudus. Though. As I said, street level Don's tend to be far more violent. They have a few less to offer. They, in fact, prey on their communities. And not all communities accept their Don's. In the community that I studied, there was an a area Don who was rich and washed with cash, but did nothing for his community. So it's a cyclical relationship that you have to provide. It, it's, it's a rational choice. You, it is very calculated among residents. If you're not providing for your community, then you don't get that assent. And you know, this done interestingly, 
he got his donship in the area by purchasing it, which is kind of new. Dons normally get their, their donship through violence. He purchased that area, allegedly from respondent, and some of the police have said this anecdotally, from Christopher Koch in that area, which shows that the strong network reached at Christopher Koch, which I refer to him as a mega don. Right? Dons tend to operate in communities that are aligned to a particular political party. I don't know. Do that here. So and you might have heard about the Shaw Posse uh, in, in, um, in America. They wreaked havoc in the 1980s in streets of Miami, also in, in New York City. Um, Christopher Koch and his, his Shaw Posse are aligned to the Jamaica Labor Party. This is his father. It's not his biological father. He was adopted by him, Lester Lloyd Koch, who took on the name Jim Brown, following the American football star. Again, that bravado thing. So he was the, the Don in the 1960s, 70s, and passed it down to his son um, to this in the 1980s. You have another guy in Kingston, Donald Phipps Ziggs, who is more aligned to the other political party, People's National Party. And essentially, these two guys, I refer to them as the last two megadons, they divided the city of Kingston in halves, right? Christopher Koch said, okay, I'll take the, east, the, the western side of Kingston, you take the eastern side, and we won't cross paths. Right? They, they did extortion at bus terminals, they extorted businessmen and, and uh, business elite. Uh, they were getting contracts, government contracts uh, from the state. They had their legitimate businesses. So again, it's a calc Dons became not only just these thugs, they were, as Vladimir Volkov says in the Russian sense, they were violent entrepreneurs. They were entrepreneurs. They divided the city of Kingston. Fancy that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, how do we then improve this context? And again, I'll look at the latest figure from the UN to see about homicide in Jamaica. And a large percentage of the homicide in Jamaica, 44%, is related to organized crime and gang related <coughs> murders, right? So, our number six ranking, it is because of the, the, the dons and gangs. The, that is what fuels. Um, that problem. Another thing I did I forgot to, to mention is that access to guns comes from uh, Jamaicans in the diaspora who send guns through uh, barrels or shipment to Jamaica who are part of the gang here. Um, but they also there's a guns for drug trade between Jamaica and Haiti. Uh, when the Haitian uh, army was disbanded in 1995 by Aristide from U.S. pressure those guns found themselves in many Caribbean territories, particularly Jamaica. And what happens is that Jamaican fishermen, they were taking food first over to Haiti. And in exchange for the food, they would get weapons or money. Then they began to take ganja. Now, ganja is everywhere. And Jamaicans here would tell it, ganja is every, you know, it, it, there's a lot of ganja in Jamaica. If you want to get it, you can get it. And uh, so the fishermen were taking bales of marijuana across to Haiti, and in exchange, they were getting guns. The dons picked up on it and said, OK, you work for us. Take these bales of marijuana, and we'll, we'll buy the guns from you. So a number of particularly handguns and revolvers are entering the ports through Haiti. And also, you have that transshipment as well. So that feeds into the, the violent subculture that, that we have. And so though this was a project largely pushed by uh, my um, perspectives on governance and political structures, that it is really a sociological cultural problem. And uh, to, to, to solve that problem requires a similar, uh, a similar approach. Um, there needs to be a serious reduction in homicides and gang-related uh, violence. The homicide rate uh, dipped in 2010, again, because the state had an onslaught on gangs. It's now going back up. There have been a number of acts passed in Jamaican anti-gang legislation has been passed. Uh, financial crimes legislation has been passed. So now you, you can't, uh, at one time you could get over um, 100,000 US. Uh, you have to tell where the source of your funding is coming from. So they have no financial crimes laws in place. Um, there needs to be an improvement in the state's presence in these communities. Uh, residents say that the police, they only come in 
uh, with aggressive police tactics. There's no relationship between themselves and the police. There's no trust between residents and the police. In fact, many of the bodyguards of Dons are police men. So there's no trust. People don't trust the police. They don't trust the religious system. In fact, they see the, just the digital system as an uptown thing. You know, it's for uptown Jamaica, the, the, the other Jamaica, right? or the middle class Jamaica. For us, our justice is a jungle justice form of justice. Because if we go to the, the official digital system, it takes time. It's very long, not accessible to us. So we need to change um, those things. There's the stigmatization of these communities. If you say you are from Tivoli Gardens in Jamaica and you apply for a, a job, oftentimes you will not get a job because of community branding. Those things have to be uh, lifted. And one thing that jumped out at me, and I wasn't even thinking about, about this, when I spoke with one resident, she said that, you know, in, in, in our community we bury the dead, but we don't grieve. We just bury the dead. So mother bury a dead son. We don't grieve. There's no grieving. And it, and it occurred to me that there needs to be social therapy and counseling. Uh, in the community that I said, you have a gang that is called the Fatherless Crew. How did they get that name? In the 1980s into the 1990s, you essentially had a civil war between the community I studied and Tivoli Gardens. You know, people got shot at the bus stop, people, families were murdered. And out of that, a number of their fathers were killed. And that is why they, they've took on the name the Fatherless Gang. These are men, young guys who are, who are hurting. They're, they have not had the time to grieve. And so there needs to be that kind of a process uh, in, in, in these communities. And it, it's happening now. The Jamaican state has started a program called Unite for Change with the Ministry of National Security. I happen to have been working with it in the early part over the summer uh, as a consultant with them. And they're trying to have more soft what they call soft policing, more community policing, uh, more counseling within these spaces. In, in garrison areas, and I'll finish now, in garrison areas, when you look, there are no businesses in, in garrison areas. Though around them, right on the periphery, there are major business areas. Business communities need to go into these areas and set up shop and help as part of lifting that stigmatization, providing access to these residents, or the cycle will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What time is it? We? Yeah, we? A lot of time. Um, I don't want So I think that um, just, I mean, growing up there, obviously, I still live there, but at the same time, um, just going to school there and kind of observing the institution of effects of this at such a young age. So for example, informers. Informers are people that mm -hmm. tell on other people, right? So I think that I, one of my best friends here who graduated in May was also Jamaican from the same area that I was from. So mm -hmm. we would come here and one of the biggest shocks that we experienced was being in class and somebody like going to the teacher and saying, oh, they didn't help with the group project. You were like, oh, yeah. <laughs> So it's still in your culture, you don't even realize mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you know other people are actually doing this thing and, and you know it's okay, I guess okay to actually tell on someone I was like, mm -hmm. You know, and so that I mean and I'm not from the garrison, but at the same time, even that fear was just instilled in me mm -hmm. you know, as a youth, and so I think that my question is really how exactly do you go about kind of changing that culture that is so mm -hmm. it, pervasive. Yeah, it is. and uh -huh. instilled in us from birth, mm -hmm. <laughs> from mm -hmm. the first minute that we're entering this school, we're also entering this school at a very young age. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you, you know, that culture takes on such a, it has such a power. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I mean, I'm 22 years old now here, mm -hmm. and that still is just like, Well, you would be happy to know that, again, through this Unite for Change program, which starts off with the, with, with the state. Right? You have to be very aware of the state, right? But there are the actors in. One of the things that they're doing is a public campaign to, to destroy that informer for, informer for dead, informer must die culture. And it is perpetuated through the dancehall culture, right? It's where they sing about this stuff, right? You're informer, you must dead. You're informer, you must leave the community. And so they're using these same artists. A number of them have said, oh, you know what? We recognize a problem. We are on board to say, look, nothing is wrong with providing information through the right channels. And so they're trying to, um, you know, wither away at that, that culture. But you're right, it's very, 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 very deep. And um, it's very pervasive. 
and yeah, if, if, if you are an informant, or what Americans call a rat, and it's, it, that is true in urban cultures, it's not just a Jamaican phenomenon, right? It, it happens across the Americas in prison. You look in, the prison, in the prison studies, they'll tell you, if you are a rat, it's the worst thing you could ever be. You look at the, the Walter Bolger story in Boston, you know, to be a rat it, is the worst thing. And so it, it is very pervasive, but there are attempts being made through popular culture mm -hmm. to, to, to minimize that, but it's, it's a difficult task. Yeah. It's a very I difficult that task. That, I mean, while I recognize that, and that's wonderful that they have some dance artists on board, you guys probably know about Gully and Gaza and things like that, which mm -hmm. are other, you know, I guess gangs you could call them. And I don't necessarily know what their involvement is with all of this stuff that you have studied, but I mean, it would surprise me because I know that some of them have, you know, criminal activity um, kind of related to them. It would surprise me if they were to kind of then, like, then perpetuate that kind of, you know, like informers are not bad within mm -hmm. the music just because they do, they are so involved in that kind of mm -hmm. activity as well, mm -hmm. you know, especially with mm -hmm. Max Cartel and the, you know, like, uh -huh. the activity that he's reputed to have been involved with. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's an uphill task yeah. for sure. Yeah. This is actually related to informers, but it begins with this the observation you made that the area dons are different and they govern in different ways. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had encountered internally in any of the communities that some of the area dons had constructed like, more sophisticated forms of justice and conflict resolution. Because I mean, the problem with the informer is that you are crossing a boundary. You're leaving this community and giving information to the first members of the community who's an outsider. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so in the class, I mean, you can see how quickly you can create these <laughs> outsider outsiders. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you know, these these communities seem to be relatively stable and they control substantial resources and that's, nothing prevents them from innovating in the areas of internal justice. You know, it can be the whim of a you know, the Don says, you know, whether having that vision, or the Don could some Don could say, you know, um, my legitimacy is based on how well I take care of my people. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna have some sort of council mm -hmm. because when people live together and they're poor, they mm -hmm. have all sorts of conflicts. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there are all sorts of uh, um, there's a really great need mm -hmm. for some kind of uh, justice. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're encountering anything there that mm -hmm. serves that. Mm -hmm. One of the things with Christopher Coke, right? People will tell you now in the aftermath of this shattering of their community mm -hmm. is that they say things are falling apart that right. Christopher Koch right. had a system yeah. of conflict resolution right. he had channels mm -hmm. look if you if any of you come to Jamaica and you get your laptop stolen in downtown Kingston before 2010 right and you say you know I'm an American researcher particularly and, and I'm going to insert the very of race here I'm a white American researcher I'm here doing my research my laptop was stolen in downtown Kingston mm -hmm. the guy said okay and he calls up Christopher Coke, one of his, his men, and they're like, okay, they know who runs what street at what time. And by the evening, they have databases and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> just like internal, internal, internal databases. They know who runs what street. And by the evening, you will get back your laptop. Okay. You will. You'll get it back. So they have these structures. Not all dons have that structure. So a more dangerous person to legitimate political authority than, say, a don that's really out for himself who purchased his... It's a, it, it's a it's it's a it's a kind of a dualism. So Christopher Koch was used, mm -hmm. he was used and he was using. So he was used by his political party that he was aligned to, and actually he was aligned to both of them, <laughs> as a mean. He was. He had cross jurisdiction in different communities, and they used Koch as a means of of disciplining, as a means of keeping the peace. Look, uh, Jamaica's homicide is very high in Tivoli, guys. If you look inside the community. It's very low. There's no violence inside. Like he had control within that community. Mm -hmm. But the, the hypocrisy is that he was helping to perpetuate crimes yeah. elsewhere. <laughs> this is a guy who's, who's renting guns, who is, is selling his, his cocaine uh, and, and whatnot, which is why I'm saying we need community councils that include these former guys, because they, they know these structures. And it has been done by um, some NGOs where, you have, where they call men on a mission. These are former hard, hard tough guys and I happened to be in a room with, with some of them and at that high school they were trying to reform some high school kids who were going awry and the guy was you know trying to, to, to tell them that you know you want you don't want to be involved in a gang one of the guys inside the class this guy's about 14 obviously he's in a gang himself and he was like you know he said a disrespectful thing and the guy he switched back like he went you know his old life 
and they had to go in and intervene and kind of stop that scoffle. So they have expertise that can be used and challenged in the right directions. The problem is that we talk about the two Jamaicas, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the other Jamaica sees uh, garrisons and dons as paras, and which perhaps there is space for that. But if, if we are going to do it reconciliation, we have to we have to integrate them in in the Jamaican society. It's almost like with the issue of, of race in this country, they seem to be uh, uh, they have been isolated and alienated. You don't want to go down there with those people. We could go down and have fun and then we leave, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have our businesses, they will come and shop from us, but we won't employ them, those people. And, and that's something that Jamaica has to, it has to confront its own soul with that. It, we, we have not gotten over that at all. And it, 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 is, a, it is a colonial relic, right? We, we have had these things before, and it filters over um, into issues of inequality and class, for sure. Good question, thank you. Yeah. And so I have several questions, yeah. right? Yeah. Several, but um, the one that I'm going to pick is, as a qualitative researcher, mm -hmm. um, and looking at your own subjectivity, as you were in and going in and out of these communities, yeah. and I, I assume in some you had an ethnic perspective, in some you had a more emic perspective. Mm -hmm. How did you navigate that? Being a Jamaican yourself, mm -hmm. understanding the colonial structure, mm -hmm. understanding the caste structure, mm -hmm. understanding colorism in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. mm. How did you go in and out? What did you use? Your mm. own personal, when you sat down and began to look at your data, mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you make the emotional piece uh, of being attached to data as a qualitative researcher? It's a whole bunch of words, right? Uh, yeah, 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 I get, I get you, I get you. Uh, yeah. I'm a qualitative researcher yeah, yeah. myself, mm -hmm. so I understand when you are from the community, mm -hmm. right, and you're researching the community mm -hmm. and the, the position that places you in mm -hmm. when you look at the data and how you tell the story. Mm -hmm. You know, Cheryl, I was like, I was like kind of an insider outsider. So, mm. uh, outsider because I, I grew up in in Portmore, right, mm -hmm. which is outside of Kingston. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, grew up in a, um, fairly, middle yeah, a fairly middle class mm -hmm. uh, family, I would say. Both mother and father are there, which is not the typical story in many of these communities. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. in many ways, I was relearning about my country. I'm like, wow, I didn't understand this. But in some ways I had, I was an insider because I could speak the language. I could start chat the part to one bit. Yo, what I'm going? And the way I would dress <laughs> yeah. and I'll be hanging out on the corner. So I, I fit in, I'm a dark skinned Jamaica. I, I fit in and me and the man, I might drink a red striped beer and we, we, we're just talking. And it, it, so, you know, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And I've made this point before. If, if you, uh, if one of our colleagues, uh, an, an Anglo-Saxon, white-skinned American went in, you would get a different kind of a response than I would. There are some things that they would certainly open up to you more about than with me. For example, it took me a long time to get very close to some of my research subjects because uh, there was, we're not sure if this guy is an informant, if he's working for the police, we don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. If I was a white skin person, oh, this guy is a, is a, is a foreigner man, let him in. <laughs> and so, so, so those open up for you being you know, a foreigner and a white skin, yeah. whereas a black skin for some, but then there are other doors that open up for me being a black skin person. I can speak the language, I can navigate the space, I can go in and out without, Mm -hmm. uh, be noticed. So, uh, so that's part of answering the question. I'm going back to, you know, to the data. So when I have the data, you know, it, it became an emotional moment for me because I'm like, am I going to fall into the, the other Jamaica, which is, right. I can write my dissertation and my research about, okay, that's what happens over there. Mm -hmm. These are bad people. We need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, half of my dissertation was, was written like that. And then a person on my committee was like, Damon, you know you're not telling the outside of the story, right? Like, what's the other side of the story? And I know you know it. And I was like, this, this, I was like, this is a moment for me, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I want to decide mm -hmm. how to tell this story. Yeah. And so, you know, someone asked me at the conference, so, Damon, what do you think? Are dance bad people? And I couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, are they really bad people? I mean, what, what does bad people mean? Right. Or even mean? And I mean, who created these monsters and how do we deal with them and and now I can speak more freely about it uh, you know after detaching yourself from from the research that they're not bad people really 
I mean, they do bad things, mm -hmm. for sure, mm -hmm. but you have to look at the overall context within which they operate. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if I say they're bad people, and I think I'm doing a disservice to the schools of residents who I spoke with, who, you know, there's one resident who said when there was a, that civil, civil war between her community and the community, she said that the Don sent her own guys with scandal bags collecting money to buy bullets. And she said, you know, and I say, they call you the professor. You know, professor, I gave the money. She said, we gave the money to buy the bullets because we know that those bullets are going to save our lives. Mark is going to kill someone else over the other side. Mm -hmm. But we had to make that calculated decision. It's uh, for survival. They had to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know this was happening in my own Jamaica. I live, you know, a, a few miles down the road, and that's happening right there uh, in the Jamaican context. Um, so yeah, I had to navigate those spaces, and I'm st I still am. Mm -hmm. Even when you know writing the articles, you still how are you going to tell that? Because it's a story you're telling. How are you going to yeah. tell yeah. tell tell that story? And part of the commission now that's happening right now in Jamaica is to see how did the state respond uh, to this? Because 76 uh, civilians were killed. Were these guys henchmen of coke, or did the military just go in and you know just? destroy everything. There are accounts that, you know, the, the army was burning, they were burning bodies, they were just going in. This is a bad community, we need to get rid of it, it's a problem, let's stamp it out. Did we train these, especially in the army? Uh, the UK trains them at, at yeah, at Sandhurst. They are trained by the UK. Um, you know, we could go back to history. The CIA was in Jamaica <laughs> in the 1980s. Yeah, no, to topple the regime. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Latin America is, you know, you're surrounded by uh, countries where the militaries would receive special training. And yes. In fact, many mm -hmm. operations happened in El Salvador and Guatemala mm -hmm. as a result mm -hmm. of that training. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That's what yes. Yeah, the, the 1970s, uh, that's, just the, that's the American story in Jamaica. So, you know, the, the, the People's National Party, the PNP, is a more left leaning. When the left turn took place in Latin America, it, it got taken up in that. And you part of what Michael Manley, who was a more left leaning, and you call democratic socialism. And, um, his hands aren't, aren't clean either. He, he, his hands are not clean either. He certainly had um, empowered communities with weapons and that kind of stuff. A lot of it was coming f uh, through Cuba via the Soviet Union. It's a Cold War stuff. And as a way to, to um, destabilize the Jamaican state and Manly, the, the United States, through the CIA, they were also weaponizing uh, gangs. I mean, when Edward Siagel, he left the Jamaican Labour Party, he became the first person that was invited to the United States by Ronald Reagan. He loved um, Edward Siaga, and he became the director of the, the carbon-based initiative, the CBI, at the time. So, you know, it, it was part of what we're seeing now also has some Cold War rhetoric, and the U.S. is involved, as it is in most of the hemispheric politics. It's, it's true, you know. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, do you find that it's sort of frustrating doing this integrative work on a community level when, you know, I mean, we like to kind of look at these microcosms of biopolitics and mm -hmm. violence as um, examples of what not to do and how not to lead, but these are just restaging the very biopolitics that are state sanctioned, you know, the, the mm -hmm. violence that is state sanctioned mm -hmm. on the macro level. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you kind of come up against that sort of frustration of working within the community mm -hmm. um, where these community members feel that stigmatized, you know, they feel stigmatized, you know, that, that yeah, we're the violent community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but at the same time, knowing that there's this trickle-down effect mm -hmm. that's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I just wonder if that's a source of frustration for you. It, it is. I mean, it's something that, you know, even going through the data and writing about this stuff and talking about this stuff, you're like, look, there's a, there's a macro, in other words, these residents almost are pawns in this bigger game. Yeah. Right, and they're used by everybody. Yeah. Uh, the police, they go in, they, Jamaica, well, it's going down now, extrajudicial killings by the police. In 2013, you had 220 uh, extrajudicial killings by the police. It's fallen to 110 last year. In response to that, the state says we're gonna let police wear body cameras. But residents tell you that when the police come in, they don't engage them in a conversation that they would do to other Jamaicans. You know, they kick off their doors. Where's the gun? Where's the drugs? You know, they, they, they drag their men and their kids out into the streets. They, they abuse their women. It's a very abusive, um, and so that biopolitics of violence is, is, is always perpetuated. 
there are changes taking place for sure. The new minister is trying to change the face of the police force. Like, you know, you can't meet, meet violence with violence all the time. You need to have some kind of rehabilitative soft side as well. So it's true, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult and, you know, each time I talk about it, it's like, whoa. <laughs> there were interviews I had that I didn't even include. There are some things that I heard that I didn't repeat that they're on my hard drive. I haven't used that data. I probably will never use that data. There are some things that people that they tell you and when you do the triangulation, you say, oh, that might be that missing puzzle. And the names, so the, you know, and, and you see these people uh, in the media and you know, and you know that they are part and parcel of, of the problem, you know. Even the issue of ganja, there may, you know, uh, many well-to-do Jamaicans were part of the ganja. Um, so would you say that, you know, you may have begun your question with, you know, we're the violent ones. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's actually something people in the communities feel? I mean, I don't see them saying that they themselves are the violent ones. They, they know they're stigmatized. Mm -hmm. They know they can't get the job in the shopping center across the road. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's more of like a, a double consciousness thing. It's like we know how other mm -hmm. people perceive us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that feeling of like, mm -hmm. whatever we do is mm -hmm. going yeah. to be read yeah. in a certain mm -hmm. Way. Yeah, and I, up on down. And I give you a story. One of the things that they're doing now is trying to have the kids leave the community to go to. A lot of people they don't know that there are other parts of Jamaica that exist. Some of these former gang guys who were fighting for dawns on the ground were getting contracts. They've never been to a resort area. <laughs> They've never been to the to the, the countryside of Jamaica. They've never experienced the finer things about their culture. They don't know that these things exist. So in, in some ways, they know what, what others say about them. But they themselves have not been exposed to a different life, as it were, in many ways. They don't know. They've never been to a beach. And then we could talk about issues about class and inequality, because, I mean, you know, we have to pay to go into a beach. It's a whole different debate about, you know, so, you know, uh, visitors can enjoy our country more than locals can. Yes, absolutely. In the tourist sector. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, kind of, but playing on the whole um, idea of being the violent ones, and you spoke about grieving. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, talking about May 2010, there's probably tons of PTSD going on. Mm -hmm. um, and children are growing up with all this violence, but mm -hmm. how open would the community be to talking about their feelings? Because there sounds like there's so many parallels between mm -hmm. the gangs in Jamaica, between the gangs that we have in Durham, and you know, stuff that so plagues mm -hmm. really this uh, entire uh, place. Uh, um, and in those communities, from what I know and been exposed to, it's a refusal to acknowledge feelings. It is, no, I need to be the hard one. Mm -hmm. My father's gone. He's mm -hmm. in jail. He's been murdered. I have to shut off everything that I would feel as a child, because now, as a 10-year-old, I'm supposed to be the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where does that That's very interesting. Interesting on two levels for me. One is that right now I'm applying to the dean for some professional funds to do a cross study between Kingston and Greensboro, looking at youth risk factors to violence. And the, the context perpetuates these kinds of, of, of violent things, right? One of the things in Jamaica is that, you know, a bad man don't cry. You know, bad men don't talk about their feelings. Yeah. You're not a man. You're not a man. You're a girl. That's not a girly thing to do. You don't talk. And, and even when I spoke to the female, she's like, look, we just buried the dead. We don't have time to to grieve. Grieving is not something that we do. They've become so hard. And so, you know, you're right, you know. Those things are happening to them and it's difficult to, to, to go through them and to see through them. And it, it helps to perpetuate that cycle because th there is a subculture of what a man is, particularly, and a number of the gang members are youth, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be man. And at the larger Jamaican context, I mean, Jamaicans, you could chime in on this, mm -hmm. is that Jamaicans tend not to talk too much about their feelings like that. We just mm -hmm. toughen up. We yeah. ban our belly yes. and we go through, go through, right? Like, you know, I have a Jamaican friend who says that she has, and, you know, I'm going to come off insensitive, but I'm just making mm -hmm. a point that she has, um, what did you call like ADHD or, uh, you know, attention deficit disorder? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, and she's like, you see, you Jamaican, you know, and the other person in Jamaica are suffering, but they don't talk about that. <laughs> when I first started teaching here, and I students said I have a disability, I'm like, okay, this has a broken arm or a leg. She's like, no, I have. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, <laughs> a Jamaican 
what that you just do what you gotta do you get over it you just you get over it you know you they're like toughen up <laughs> toughen up you do it's and it's not a Jamaican it's a Caribbean thing it, yeah. um, you talk about calismo in Latin America right the machismo the strong the strength that you just have to to forbear and I, I think it's a trickle down from colonialism right <laughs> it, it is a trickle down from colonialism that look you have to toughen up yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, I was just going to say, yeah, as another, I mean, just another example of that, I think that goes into so many realms of Jamaican culture, and even just in education, um, going to school there, we have the British system, and writing a paper at school, if I use the word I, oh. zero. Oh no! Like you don't, you don't write your opinion. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not, it's yeah, the first part. You know, one may say that. Mm. Yeah. Like, yeah, I didn't think so. No. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. So you know, yeah, I was trained. So I went to um, a few years in high school up here in, uh, in New Hampshire. And so when I went there, my English teacher would get really mad at me because he'd be like, actually, like. What do you think? And I'm like, why do you want me to think? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not based on my feelings or my opinions. It took me a long time to be able to really express myself in that sense. And like I said, it's not necessarily I'm coming from a valid background in those communities, however. But that is also instilled in the culture beyond, I mean, even just your environment. You know what I mean? It sounds like there's a merge as an English teacher. It sounds like there's a merging actually between the colonial education legacy, the, the British and French, you know speaking this disembodied voice, mm -hmm. and then, you, and you don't use I, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then this also culture of, you know, like the, the native informant and, mm -hmm. you know, you do yeah. Not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like they're merging together to this mm -hmm. moment where the, there's, there's a, not a lot of self-reflection mm -hmm. coming on, mm -hmm. right? But and then the irony is even to piggyback on that is that even though Jamaicans don't speak about themselves, they're very expressive, right? And they're very opinionated. And yeah, there's a strong opposition on party. Where there's injustice, they'll be the first to speak out against it, right? And then we talk about Garvism. I was watching Malcolm X last night, and you know, Garv, it, it, you know, Pan-Africanism, which informed people like Malcolm X, which informed the civil rights movement. I mean, Claude McKay, who was part of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, so Jamaicans, through their culture, their music are very oppositional, and anyway, it's injustice. So I won't speak for myself, but if you are being just against you, I will fight for you to the very end. This is what Iran is. This is sort of like the kind of communal, the communalism versus like the individualism. Yeah. You know, the kind of in the, the states is sort of the every man for himself. Your opinion matters, you know, and then the sort of um, other kind of side of things, which is the, if it's not right for the community, you shut uh -huh. up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, you. Uh, I have a lot of questions. Sure. Uh, there's, there's no way to really to get to it all, but I guess the one that I'll, that I'll go with Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is to what degree, when you were doing your interviews, did people reflect back to the state? So like talking about issues having to do with corruption, so something going outside of this kind of dawn area, to thinking about mm -hmm. how it is that the state could either do something to mm -hmm. help to improve their lives or that mm -hmm. the state is just mm -hmm. bankrupt in terms of having any sort of influence mm -hmm. right? and so it doesn't really matter this this is our government this is our mm -hmm. this is our state right mm -hmm. this is my area that i live in mm -hmm. this is you know the mm -hmm. my, my nation so to speak because mm -hmm. that's you know my mm -hmm. boundaries are that's it right? mm -hmm. um and i ask that because um i unfortunately take a very very sad and cynical view toward uh politics in the caribbean in general mm -hmm. um Formal yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because there's just so much of this issue with gangs and major corruption, mm -hmm. right? Um, particularly in these areas that are just so small. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so I, I wonder about this issue of the degree to which you can have a top-down approach as compared to some sort of you know, grassroots or bottom-up approach, and it just kind of all, again, mm -hmm. it just, there are just too many issues to kind of... Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I feel you. I think I feel you. One of the things that about, I should say about dons is that unlike an ISIS, right, or that wants to create a caliphate, dons are not interested in taking over the state. They don't want that. Oh. They, they don't care. Yeah. They want to have pockets of communities within the state to run their own personal right. enterprises. They still rely on 
is a member of parliament, she's elected official. Because the MP gives them that, 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 that appearance of authenticity. So the state is still very much intertwining that in communities. People will always refer to the state that, you know, we would love to trust the police, but they are so corrupt. <laughs> right or the government, the state. I always say the government is not doing anything in our area to fix the sewage. They should be doing here. If it was uptown, they would be doing. It. So they they know what this what the state ought to do for them. They understand the social contract, right? Right. They know that. I mean, Mark, you know, in many of these guys in areas, they, they they don't pay land tax. They're not paying for electricity and stuff like that. And they're like, we're not going to pay for anything if we're not getting good service, anyways. So they understand the responsibilities of the state, and they expect the state to step up. But in in the absence of that, they make a calculated decision that we will rely on a don or several dons for different things. And they're, they're very, it, 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 it's a very performative body, like, you know, Judith Butler. They, they, they're very performative. They understand these, these things, right? So we will rely on the don for security in our community, but we still need the MP to fix uh, the roads. Yeah. Or we will go on to uh, the Grace Kennedy Foundation, which is a food um, company, and see if they can help us to build a sports complex. So they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are performing these things. They go to different groups to get the things that they want. They understand that it is not going to come to them. So they go out and seek it. Yeah. I just, it's, it's hard because you see many of these types of um, I guess they call them situations and hierarchies playing out in many different nations mm -hmm. at different economic levels, mm -hmm. right? So like, it doesn't really necessarily matter. Um, I mean, not that it doesn't matter what your GDP is, mm -hmm. right? But that you can't, your country can be particularly um, economically viable Ste mm -hmm. right? and supposedly stable, right? Mm -hmm. But because of the type of corruption mm -hmm. that you have at the top, mm -hmm. The people are just taking for themselves instead of trying to see what they can do to improve the nation. And so uh -huh. I'm wondering, just again, this is more normative, mm -hmm. right? Like, what can we do to to fix that? Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't really know where to go from there. And we have examples throughout history and in different places that, mm -hmm. you know, suggest that we've been able to see where we have gangs taking over places mm -hmm. and there being a lot of corruption and then perhaps over time we've moved away from it. Mm -hmm. But to what degree can we kind of glean something useful from that to, mm -hmm. to take into these situations mm -hmm. to improve things? Mm -hmm. like? You know, as a, as a political um, scientist, that, that, that side of me, I still think the book um, starts and ends with the state, right? The state is hollowed out because of its economic priorities, also its levels of corruption. Mm -hmm. We compare Jamaica to a Barbados, for example, they don't have the same kinds of problems. Yeah, it's right. far more, a much smaller place. Mm -hmm. Its economy is stabler. It, it has a different cultural makeup to win Barbados mm -hmm. than Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. It has a more docile, the, the subcultures of violence are not as strong in, in Barbados as it yeah. is uh, in Jamaica. So there is a role to be played by the state. The state must stand up, the state must govern. It has to, right? And I believe that institutions can lean and help to shape or change uh, cultural practices over time. It, it just has to. And in Jamaican case, it's really the state. It, it began with political leaders. Again, we have this, and this is a Caribbean thing, right? Latin America is stuck, where you have this, um, the, the leadership is very important to these societies. Again, it's a colonial relic, right? You look to that charismatic central leader, right? The state should provide, the leader will provide for wherever you lead, we will follow the charismatic type of leader. And so, you know, and so they use that especially in Jamaican context, politicians use that to their own advantages and played with these communities. Mm -hmm. And part of fixing that problem has to, to begin with them. They have to sever ties. You have MPs who still are paying um, and giving contracts to criminal gangs. That has to stop, right? It happens in Trinidad too. It happens in Guyana too. Uh, it happens in Venezuela. It happens in Haiti. Which is why so Latin American and Caribbean <laughs> politics has been very volatile and Yes. It's around twenty after right now or some oh, yeah. either class at one twenty five where they got work that they need to get to. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Good discussion. So I just want to say thank you again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.